just about the uh, what's going on in Loudoun County and the business community, what's been going on for so many years, and just how vital and crucial it is to the growth uh, happening in Northern Virginia, and just how critical it is for the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth, and it is an honor to be here today. When I moved back to the area about a year ago, I knew that campaign 2013 was going to be exciting, or I hoped it would, and it has certainly proven to be just that. It is really exciting to be covering this campaign and be here today to talk with the Attorney General candidates and have a lively debate. So very excited and honored. Thank you for having me here today. So why don't we bring up the candidates and the panelists and uh, get it going right back. So come on up. We're going to bring up uh, first the, of course, the Democratic, Sen the Democratic Senator Mark Herring. Standing for Attorney General, Senator Herring is an attorney from here in Leesburg, so obviously a very familiar face here in Loudoun County. He served as a Loudoun County Supervisor from 2000 to 2004, and has been a member of the Virginia Senate since 2006. Uh, Senator Mark Herring, Democratic Senator for Attorney General. In the race here. Uh, Senator Robin Chain is attorney from Harrisonburg. He has served as a state senator in the General Assembly since 2004. So, Senator Mark Robin Chain, welcome to our panelists. Now, to our panelists, Dr. Julie Lighting of Northern Virginia Community College. Come on up, Julie. There we are, there she is. Uh, Ms. Eileen Kenny of Colonel Bank. Eileen. A good reminder to us all. And Dr. Ali Eskandarian of the George Washington University, or as Brian said, the George Washington University, and Dean of the Science and Technology Campus. So uh, before we get going, I do want to read the rules for this morning's uh, debate. Uh, number one, each candidate is allowed a five minute opening statement and a five minute closing statement. Senator Herring, who did win the pre-debate coin toss, will go first for the opening statement and for the closing statement as well. Senator Herring will also begin the debate by answering the first question. Each candidate will be given two minutes to respond to the question directed to them on their turn. The other candidate will then be given two minutes to offer a rebuttal response. The original candidate will then be given one minute to respond to the rebuttal. We're going to try to keep it tight as we keep things moving. The order in which the candidates will be asked questions Alternate until the time allotted for questions expires, at which time the closing statements will begin. These questions have not been shared with the candidates beforehand. Now, a chamber staff member, Grafton, my friend here, is serving as the timekeeper, depending on you, my friend. A yellow card is going to be raised to indicate the candidate has 30 seconds to finish their response. A red card, we all know what red means, will be raised when the time has expired. So let us begin the five minute opening statement. Senator Herring, you're up first. It is great to be home. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the Loudoun Chamber for hosting this debate, as well as Senator Openshade to Loudoun County. And you know, as I stand here at the National Conference Center and, and look out at all of you, I'm reminded of the great communities we have here in Loudoun, like we have all across Virginia. And to be sure, we have our challenges. But when we're at our best, we work through those challenges together. We listen to everybody, we work through our differences, and we move forward. That's the kind of leader I am. That's the kind of attorney general I'll be. And you know, that's the Virginia way. And it stands in vivid contrast to what we see right now in Washington, where a faction of Tea Party politicians has shut the government down and using uh, hundreds of thousands of Virginians as political funds and jeopardizing our economic recovery. Now, Senator Robinshane shares that same extreme approach. He sought and received the Tea Party endorsement because he agrees with them and he votes with them. And he and his ticket mates, Ken Cuccinelli and E.W. Jackson, also share that same extreme approach. In a Cuccinelli, Jackson, Open Chain, Virginia, politicians in Richmond dictate to women what they can and cannot do with their own bodies. Senator Openshade sponsored twice, once with Cuccinelli, the person that bill that would uh, outlaw and take away a woman's right to choose, even in cases of rape and incest, and ban common forms of birth control. 
Senator Rosenstein called the transvaginal ultrasound bill that he voted for. Common sense legislation. It was so extreme, even Governor McDonald had to step in and force it to back down. In a Cuccinelli, Jackson, Open Chain, Virginia, gays and lesbians in Virginia would be treated like second class citizens. Senator Ogenshane, time and again, has voted against giving gays and lesbians protections that other Virginians have guaranteed under the law. Senator Ogenshane even walked off the Senate floor rather than confer a judge, a sitting judge, a former Navy Top Gun pilot, just because he happened to be gay. Senator Ogenshane with Cuccinelli and Jackson, they would sentence us to more gridlock less time with our families, less productivity at work, because he voted against the landmark transportation bill supported by Democrats and Republicans. Well, I have a different view of the job of Attorney General. I believe in the quaint notion that the law, not extremist politics, is the essence of the job. I was raised by my mom, right here in Loudoun County. One of the lessons she drilled into me as a kid was if you see something wrong, if you see a problem, you have a duty, a responsibility to try to fix it. Well, right now, we all see a problem in the Attorney General's office. There has been way too much politics and not enough problem solving. And Senator Rogenshane would be a continuation of what we have right now with Ken Kuchinel. I will refocus the office on protecting Virginians and keeping our families and our communities safe. I will track down against sexual, against, against uh, criminals who would commit child sexual abuse. I will support our military veterans, our service members, and their families. I'll continue my work to prevent sexual and domestic violence and abuse. I will defend and protect people's civil rights. And the women of Virginia will know if I'm Attorney General, I will protect their privacy and make sure they have the right to make their own health care decisions. I will return to the very highest ethical standards to the Attorney General's office. And as Attorney General, I will take the politics out of the office and I'll put the law and Virginians first. Senator O'Brien. Well, I want to thank the Loudon Chamber and Jen. Thank you for hosting and for moderating this debate. And I want to thank all of you for coming and participating in this forum this morning. I want to tell you, my name's Mark Ovenchain, and I've represented the Shenandoah Valley in the Senate of Virginia for the past 10 years. And for the past two years, I've been traveling all over Virginia, sharing with Virginians my positive view, my positive vision for what I want to do as Virginia's next Attorney General. It really boils down to two priorities. One is keeping our community safe. And number two, keeping Virginia a great place to do business. Now to do that, we've got to focus on making sure that our kids are safe in and out of school. They're facing the threats of drugs, of gangs, of violence, of human trafficking, which is happening right here in Loudoun County. In Loudoun County. We also have to protect our seniors. And then, with respect to our economy, I understand the regulations are the number one job killer in America. And we've got to refocus in the Attorney General's office on regulatory review and reform. We also have to make sure that we stand up and claim the benefits of our right to work laws here in Virginia. And that when the federal government reaches over the line, like it did in Fairfax County with stormwater breaks, that we've got an Attorney General who's got the guts, the determination, to stand up and push back where appropriate circumstances exist. Now, while I've been sharing my positive view and agenda about what I'm going to do as Attorney General, Mark has been traveling, engaging in this same kind of false negative attacks, focusing on social issues all over the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, we're here at the Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to talk to you about some economic issues that are going to affect the business community. My view is that in order to keep Virginia strong, a great place to do business, we've got to keep our tax burden low, our regulatory system fair, and to make sure that we have a level playing field. And I've supported those policies in my 10 years in the Senate. And those are the same things that Forbes magazine looked to uh, just last week when it named Virginia the best state to do business 
and Americans. Mark, on the other hand, has supported policies dating back to when he was on board of supervisors here in Loudoun County that thwarted development and economic development. Saw the county's largest private employer pack up and leave. Saw property taxes increase at a double-digit rate and left with a hundred million dollar budget deficit. And then, with respect to a level playing field, we had a the nation's largest, one of the nation's largest public works projects being built right here in Loudoun County. And last year, there was an effort to make it a union set aside project with project labor agreements. I fought to make sure that project was open for all bidders. Mark sided with organized labor and fought for a mandatory project labor agreement knowing that every extra penny spent on that project was going to be tacked on to the tolls paid by commuters in Loudoun County commuting to their jobs. And then, let's talk about small businesses. You know, I run two small businesses. I manage a law firm with 70 employees, another one with 50 employees that I started from scratch. You know, last week, I received an endorsement of the National Federation of Independent Business. I'm proud of that. You know, over the course of 10 years, I'm the only senator who's received a 100% rating from the National Federation of Independent Businesses for standing side by side with those businesses uh, during the course of that time. Over the past two years, Mark has amassed a rather unimpressive 45% rating, an F from the NFIB. He did, in fairness, get 100% from uh, the FLCIO. Uh, I just want you to know that with respect to business issues, with respect to keeping Virginia strong, with respect to keeping our community safe, there are important differences that we ought to be talking about. I'm proud also to have the support of 116 sheriffs and Commonwealth's attorneys, including your great sheriff, Mike Chapman, and your Commonwealth's attorney, Jim Plowman, supporting me in my bid. And those people cross party lines. They're independent, Democrat, and Republican. I look forward to engaging in a discussion with you. I look forward to uh, uh, talking about issues that are going to make Virginia stronger. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you with a strong climate of ethics. I think we can all agree about that. After the ethics scandal involving Governor McDonald, who is currently under investigation, and to a lesser degree, Attorney General Cuccinelli, who to be clear is not under investigation, what role do you believe the Attorney General should play in improving the current ethical climate in the Commonwealth, and how can you get it done? First question, Senator Hearn. Well, thank you, Ed. We do need serious ethics reform, and frankly, Senator Overshane has been AWOL on this issue. When uh, the revelations first came to light about the gift to Governor McDonald back in the spring uh, of a $15,000 gift to either him or his family. I immediately recognized that as wrong. And unfortunately, our current Attorney General was caught up in the same uh, compromising situation and unable to investigate, so I contacted the Justice Department and asked for an independent investigation. That was back in April. And I've continued to hold the Governor and the Attorney General accountable for those actions, calling on them to return the gifts and the fair market value. Meanwhile, Senator Robinshane was silent or AWOL, and then ultimately when asked whether he should return the gifts, uh, he said it was some kind of political calculation. You know, it's not about a political calculus, it's about doing what's right. And I have called, come out with this ethics plan. We need uh, an ethics commission, an independent ethics commission to be able to investigate allegations of, of wrongdoing. We need a complete gift ban that needs to be extended to uh, family members of elected officials. We need to strengthen penalties where there are violations. Uh, we need to make sure that campaign funds can't be used for personal contributions or personal expenses. These are elements of my uh, ethics plan. Senator Overshane doesn't have one. You know, we need a strong attorney general who will come in and return ethics to the Office of Attorney General. And you know, our current Attorney General is, at least the office is under investigation for another uh, scandal, and that is the involvement with Console Energy in a case where he sided against uh, out-of-state energy, sided with out-of-state energy companies 
against uh, ordinary property owners in Virginia who are just trying to get what they're entitled to. You know, it is time to return ethics to the Attorney General's office, and I'm the right candidate to do that. Senator Obachin. You know, one thing that Virginia voters ought to be able to count on, that is that our elected officials are there to serve them, not to enrich themselves. It's clear. It's also clear that over the course of the past year, voter confidence, public confidence has been eroded in the integrity of our system. And we've got to be proactive in doing it. I don't blame Mark for not uh, reading my news releases, but uh, I've been proactive since July in uh, talking about what it is that we need to do. You know, I run two law firms, and I've been an ethics officer for those firms. I understand the importance of maintaining a high level of ethical standards in the office and making sure that we avoid even the appearance of impropriety. I've made it clear that when I'm elected Attorney General, I'm going to propose and advocate the passage of legislation, not just policies for my office, but legislation that will cap debts at $100 per person, that it will apply to members of the household, that it will increase the reporting requirements, and will look at penalties. And whether that passes the General Assembly or not, I will be the Chief Personnel Officer in the Attorney General's office, and that will be the rule in the Attorney General's office, irrespective of what the General Assembly does. And I've gone farther than that. I've also made it clear that when the Attorney General's office is operated, it needs to be transparent. And one of the biggest things that happens is Attorney Generals uh, hire outside counsel, contingency fee lawyers, and it, you know, that's, a, that's a nice thing. But we need more transparency in the Attorney General's office. And I've proposed making clear uh, contributions made to the Attorney General need to be disclosed and also to cap contingency fee, uh, fees in the Attorney General's office. We need to be proactive and aggressive in addressing these ethical issues, and I've been very clear on the campaign trail that I'm going to do that. Senator Herring, one minute. You know, you stand here to talk about uh, ethics reform, but you didn't come out with a plan when, at all other than the gift ban, and there's a lot more that we could be doing. And when you have the opportunity to vote for a gift ban on legislators in committee a few years ago, you voted against it and voted to kill it. You have yet to criticize Ken Cuccinelli for his handling of the Star Scientific scandal. We need to have an attorney general who can stand up and do the right thing. Okay, Senators, thank you very much. We're going to turn it over to the panel now. Uh, Julie Lyon has a question first for Senator Yes. Uh, the duties and powers of the Office of Attorney General include defending the constitutionality of state laws when they are challenged in court. The incumbent Attorney General has recently indicated that he will not defend the law allowing the state to take over chronically failing schools because he believes it is unconstitutional. Do you believe the Attorney General has the discretion to decide which laws, adopted by the General Assembly and signed by the Governor, to defend? And if so, what criteria will you employ when weighing whether to use that discretion? Thank you very much. You know, the oath of office of the Attorney General imposes upon him or her the obligation of defending state law and state constitution. And uh, I treat that very seriously, and I will perform that obligation. We as uh, lawyers have professional obligations as well uh, to appear in court only in matters in, on which we have a good faith, legal, and factual basis for defending it. General Assembly adopts a facially invalid uh, uh, piece of legislation that clearly violates all constitutional standards, and there's no basis for defending it. Uh, we can't. But if it is a defensible constitutional provision and uh, applying the presumption of constitutionality, I'm going to defend it. And uh, the Opportunity Education Initiative is one area upon which I disagree with the current attorney general. I, it would not be my preferred way of dealing with failing schools. I think that there are a lot better ways, like opening the door for charter schools, which uh, I, Mark and others have stood in the way up. But it's what we've got. And I believe that it is important for us to stand up where a good faith basis exists. And in that case, there are three constitutional provisions that address the authority of the General Assembly, uh, the authorities of local school boards, and uh, the authority of the, uh, of the governor's office that we need to read in harmony with one another. 
And in that instance, I believe that there is a good faith basis for defending that. I think that we need to look at this issue. We've got uh, issues like the uh, uh, environmental regulations that are being uh, proposed in Southwest Virginia four years ago or several years ago, 3202 passed on transportation and uh, a constitutional challenge was mounted to that. We deserve to know whether our candidate for G attorney general is going to defend those uh, statutes. Mark has indicated he's going to take a poll in the attorney general's office before deciding. And uh, I'm not going to do that. Senator here in two minutes. Well, first of all, Mark, I would suggest that you dust off your law books and remind yourself that the Constitution is the law also. The United States and Virginia constitutions are primary, foundational law, and the General Assembly cannot pass laws that contravene the Constitution. As Attorney General, you're the state's chief legal officer heading up the legal department. And what I would do when questions come up and laws are challenged, what I would do, and I don't know where you got this about the poll. I have no idea what you're talking about. Richmond Dutch Dispatch. Well, I don't know which, I don't know what they're talking about in our poll, but I tell you what I would do. I'll tell you what I would do. I would bring together the legal experts within the Attorney General's office and who have expertise in the subject matter of uh, the lawsuit and review very carefully the legal precedents, Virginia, United States Supreme Court cases, and other cases, assess. The, the legal analysis, and to make a decision, a good faith, honest, deliberate decision whether I believe the law was constitutional or not. That's the responsibility of the Attorney General. And you know, I'll be called upon from time to time to defend laws I personally disagree with. But while I didn't may disagree with the policy of the law, if it was validly passed and it's constitutional, you know, I will defend that and go to the mat for it. But what I won't do is ignore the Constitution, and we can't do that. That's foundational law. That's primary law. And an attorney general must give it effect. That's how I would handle those. You know, on this school takeover law, I voted against it, both on policy reasons and constitutional grounds. I thought there were better strategies. The children would be better off, the students would be better off by employing strategies that had been proven elsewhere around the country to help uh, improve achievement. Also voted against it because the state constitution said that schools were to be supervised by local school boards. So that's how the approach that I would take, and I would make sure that the attorney general's office reviews that carefully with the experts. One minute, Senator Overton. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I heard an answer there as to whether Mark is going to defend that lawsuit or not. I think that it is imperative for us to step up, and I know Mark's not a litigator, a real estate lawyer, but uh, it is not rocket science to figure out whether a good faith basis exists for defending these lawsuits. I've been very upfront and direct with the people of Virginia in explaining whether I'm going to defend these lawsuits or not. And I think we owe it. We owe it to the people of Virginia to tell them what we're going to do on this and the other lawsuits that are filed. And you know what? Mark talks about taking the politics out of the Attorney General's office. One thing we've learned from the Supreme Court over the course of the past year is that if an Attorney General doesn't defend a lawsuit, the state may be in default. There is no more profound way of inserting your personal politics into the Attorney General's office than to say, I'm not going to defend a lawsuit and watch a constitutional provision or a statute fail by default. It's wrong. Okay, we're going to move on now to a question about a uh, about Medicaid, which has certainly been a big topic throughout campaign 2013, certainly in the governor's race. Alan Kennedy, your question on that topic. Yes, Senator Aaron, the 2013 General Assembly charted the path forward on Medicaid reform first to be followed by potential expansion. Combating fraud is likely to be a significant part of reform and a significant cost saver. The Attorney General has the authority to conduct or assist criminal investigations and prosecutions involving Medicaid fraud. What programs or initiatives do you plan to institute as Attorney General to step up efforts to combat Medicaid fraud? Senator Herring, you have first two minutes. Well, thank you. And first of all, I can't stand here and, and let a comment go that I, I'm not a litigator. I, I'm looking out at a lot of clients and lawyers that I've worked with and against. And I cut my teeth in the old courthouse of these work. So I know my way around the court. Uh, on Medicaid, you know, I support Medicaid expansion together with reform. And 
Medicaid will, Medicaid expansion will provide uh, health care to hundreds of thousands of Virginians who currently can't afford it and don't have access to health care. Uh, the Medicaid expansion will bring billions of dollars into the Virginia economy, creating an estimated 30,000 jobs or more. It is critically important that we move forward with that, including the reforms that were specified in the commission. My opponent, Senator Obenshane, has opposed it, specifically spoke out against it, and opposes accepting the Medicaid funding and, and denying the health care to hundreds of thousands of Virginians and the, the money that would come from the federal government to implement it. And the reforms are important, as are tough enforcement. And you know, as Attorney General, I will investigate allegations of fraud and root it out wherever it exists. We've got to make sure that we achieve the cost savings of Medicaid reform, including rooting out fraud and abuse. Senator Overshane. You know, the Attorney General's office has a number of statutory responsibilities, and frankly, it's not just an option for the Attorney General's office to uh, pursue Medicaid fraud. It's a mandate from, uh, from federal law. Uh, the Attorney General is the only entity in Virginia that is authorized to pursue Medicaid fraud. And there's a Medicaid fraud uh, unit that I call MIFQ in the Attorney General's office that is one of the largest and most successful uh, divisions within the office of the Attorney General. They have gone after significant fraud, and frankly, there is significant fraud out there that needs to be pursued because these are our tax dollars that are at work. And what we found is increasingly over the course of the past few years, Medicaid fraud has become big business for organized crime and others. And we have got to work with our health care providers in order to uh, cooperatively go after this. And I want to tell you that it does not need to be a confrontational process. I was just talking with a doctor in here a little while ago about the kind of confrontation that they've seen with uh, with uh, the federal government over over Medicaid fraud uh, investigations. I think that it's imperative for us to recognize who are our enemies and who are our friends. And we have healthcare institutions in Virginia who are not setting out to defraud the taxpayers. And we've got to work cooperatively to identify weaknesses in the system, to figure out what is fraud and what is not, to aggressively go out and uh, pursue collection of those uh, uh, fraudulent uh, collection of uh, monies that are diverted to fraud because those dollars are depriving people of important access to health care. Every dollar that is, that is fraudulently diverted is a dollar that cannot be spent to actually improve access to health care. So, Senator Rubenstein, your thoughts on the Medicaid expansion, again, which has become a big issue in 2013? Sure. Well, I thought the question dealt with Medicaid fraud, but I'll tell you that I, uh, I did, did deal with Medicaid fraud, but I'll tell you, I voted against the Medicaid expansion. I believe that we've got an awful lot of work that needs to be done in expanding access to uh, health care. And you get no disagreement with me that our system needs work, that it is broken. And we have got to make sure that we ex that we reform Medicaid. I know that the General Assembly and the Governor I, I created this plan for a possible expansion. And as Attorney General, my job is going to be to work with the Governor and with the General Assembly in implementing what they decide to do over the course of the next four years. I understand. Senator Harris, quick uh, one minute rebuttal. Well, you know, I was going to raise the, the same question you just did in the rebuttal, and that is, you know, there are, some, there, there are some similarities, but a lot of differences between two of us as candidates. When it comes to rooting out Medicaid fraud and abuse, we're both going to be aggressive in going after it. We're both going to work with health care providers, managed care companies, physicians, and others to do that. But where there's a real difference is on the Medicaid expansion and on health care. And Senator Robuchain has vowed to use the powers of the office to continue to fight legal battles against health care, and that's not moving Virginia forward. You know, it's the law of the land. A conservative Supreme Court has ruled it constitutional. We need to move forward. We don't need to continue to, to fight these battles that has now brought the Congress and federal government to a halt. We need to move forward with Medicaid expansion. It will bring billions of dollars into our economy, create tens of thousands of jobs, and help hundreds of thousands of Virginians. Thank you, Senator. We're going to move on to an issue now that everybody in Loudoun County is quite familiar with. It's about tolling. Dr. Mm -hmm. Gary, your question, sir. Well, let me thank candidates for coming here. 
subjecting themselves. These questions are from the loudmaker here, but it's from the loud and chamber of commerce. If you happen to dislike any of them or find them difficult, remember the name of Henry Howard. Just the mention of his name. <laughs> <laughs> so this is for Senator Obershank. Turn the mic over here for a second. Senator Obershank, as you may know, the State the Corporation Commission is currently conducting an investigation of the Dallas Greenways tolling policy. Uh, as recently as January of this year, the State Corporation Commission approved the toll hike for the Greenway. Because the State Corporation Commission is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, it's difficult to for businesses to understand the Corporation Commission's reasons for granting the toll fine, or indeed its reasoning on any other decision that may impact the business community. Given how important this agency is to the regulation of businesses in the Commonwealth, should it be subject to freedom of information and disclosure law? Very good question, Senator Robichin. Tolling people have a lot of questions where that money is going to. Yeah, and you know what? One of the reasons that uh, we had that proceeding, and one of the reasons that those tolls went up and will automatically go up every single year is legislation that aren't put in that guarantees an annual increase in the tolls. I believe that it's important for the Office of the Attorney General to have a role in these toll proceedings. And uh, the Attorney General's Consumer Affairs Office has, stand, has the ability to step in and participate in these proceedings as a watchdog, as somebody who is testing the propositions made by uh, the parties to the agreement. And I would, as Attorney General of Virginia, I, I would appear on behalf of toll payers in toll proceedings and uh, would represent the consumers, the commuters of Virginia, Loudoun County and others, and frankly, you know, what we had uh, over the course of the past couple of years was uh, the uh, question of our uh, project labor agreement union set aside on the uh, metro extension that was going to result in additional increases, at least on the Dulles Toll Road, where I stood with commuters in Loudoun County and elsewhere. Mark stood with organized labor that's given him over $100,000 to his campaign. And I think that it is important to have a measure of transparency in the State Corporation Commission so that we can see the record that's being submitted, so that we can see uh, the, uh, the uh, thought process. I think that, you know, as with any judicial process, uh, judges have some uh, need for deliberative uh, privilege, but I think that it is critical for us to have access to open records. And as a lawyer, as a litigator, I know that court pockets are open for review. And the State Corporation Commission is a court, and we ought to have access. Senator. No, Mark, I cannot believe you would stand here and misrepresent the legislation that Joe May and I worked on together to cap the toll increases. Back in 2007, we saw a massive increase in the tolls on the Greenway. And Delegate May and I worked together to try to do something to keep the tolls from skyrocketing every couple of years. So we worked together, we listened to constituents to try to find a way to cap them so that the tolls will never go up more than the rate of inflation. That's what the legislation did. And you know, when it comes to tolls, when it comes to tolls, you were the one who said we should put up tolls in strategic locations in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. I mean, you know, we're getting told to death. On the specific question about the Freedom of Information Act and the State Corporation Commission, we do need greater transparency, not only the State Corporation Commission, but the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General has this opinion that it is completely exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. I think that's wrong, and I'll change that policy. I think it's wrong that the State Corporation Commission has a blanket exemption. The default position should always be that government records are open open and transparent. And if there is a specific policy reason why information shouldn't be, then that's a debate we can have uh, in the legislature to try to sort through, you know, what is the justification for not keeping the record open. But the default position should always be open and transparency in government and the State Corporation Commission. Senator Norman Chair, I know you have a lot to say. One minute, sir. You can squeeze it in. <laughs> First of all, that legislation, I know that sometimes you have to back down and uh, make a deal. 
order to salvage something. That legislation guaranteed annual toll increases, and it has exceptions big enough to drive a truck through that allows additional toll increases above the uh, cost of living adjustments that uh, are automatic every single year. I also think that it's important for us to have transparency uh, both in the State Corporation Commission and the Attorney General's Office. And frankly, that's why I sided with the National Chamber of Commerce uh, that wants more transparency with respect to hiring lawyers, uh, outside counsel in the Attorney General's Office, and tapping contingency fees, uh, which I have supported and Mark has not. Okay, I'm going to jump in here now with a question about the current Attorney General, Ken Cuccinelli, of course, who's the Republican candidate for governor. Attorney General Cuccinelli certainly has a reputation as being an activist attorney general. Whether you agree with his views or not, he's taken strong stands on abortion, gay marriage, and climate science. And again, business leaders looking around this room obviously want to know what kind of environment in which they are operating. So the question is, do you plan to follow the Cuccinelli model of an outspoken very public attorney general or something very different? I want to be clear, I'm not asking whether or not you agree with his views. But what type of attorney general do you want to be, Senator Heron, who's first? Yeah. I, I started this debate talking about why we need fundamental change in the Office of Attorney General. It's because of uh, what we've seen uh, with Ken Cuccinelli and how he's run the office. And time and again, he has bent and twisted the law and misused and abused the power uh, of the office in order to advance a personal ambition and, and an extreme ideological agenda. I think that's wrong. I want to take that kind of politics and ideology out of the office and go back to what the Attorney General should be doing, which is providing objective legal advice to the governor and his administration, to all the agencies, boards, commissions, departments, colleges, and universities of the state, and to the General Assembly, and refocus the office on protecting Virginians, keeping our families safe, supporting our, our military veterans and families, a whole host of things that it ought to be doing instead of diverting attention away from this extreme social agenda. Senator Robichet would be a continuation of what we've got. He himself has said, he and Ken Cuccinelli are like peas in a pod, philosophically. That he would use Ken Cuccinelli as a role model to follow, that he wants to pick up the baton and keep running in the same direction. If you look at his record, he's got the same record. Every time he's had a position of authority, when he was on the Board of Visitors at JMU, he used that as a platform to try to get the contraceptive plan B banned from the JMU campus. Then when he was elected as a senator, he used that as a platform to try to pass personhood legislation that would deprive a woman of the right to choose, even in cases of rape and incest, ban contraceptive, common forms of contraceptives. You know, that's not what the Attorney General's office should be about. It should be about defending people's rights. It should be about protecting Virginians and keeping our families and communities safe. It should be about about providing objective legal advice to the governor and his administration and all of the agencies, boards, and commissions of the state. As I said in my opening, false negative attacks based on social issues has dominated the campaign of my opponent for Now the question dealt with how we would run the office of the Attorney General. You know, I'm going to come to the office of the Attorney General with my own side. And nobody will dictate. I've been around long enough that I've seen a number of attorney generals. I've served in that office. And I've looked at a number of them and look at their strengths. I've looked at Jerry Blyles, my first attorney general I really remember. Jerry Blyles was Democrat, brought a great sense of professionalism and a business-like approach to that office that is critical and is still there in that office today. Jerry Kilgore and Jim Gilmore brought Strength, their strengths involved making sure that we had an attorney general's office that worked closely with law enforcement to make sure that we addressed critical public safety needs across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Bob McDonald did a great job of understanding that we need to work with the business community and making sure that our regulatory burden isn't killing jobs across Virginia. And Ken Cuccinelli, during his tenure, has served at a time in which we're dealing with the changing relationship between the states and the federal government. Last year, he linked arms with the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, Democrats, who challenged EPA regulations that were going to divert hundreds of millions of transportation dollars 
to compliance with what turned out to be illegal uh, environmental regulations. I'm going to look at each of those and look at them for the strengths that they brought to that office. But I'm going to bring my own stock to that office in running the office of the Attorney General. What I consider here. Now, I am talking about the positive ideas I have for the office. I am talking about cracking down on child sexual predators. I am talking about protecting our seniors from financial fraud and abuse. I am talking about supporting our veterans and our military families. But you know, you can't just say, well, it's a negative campaign because you point out my record. You know, that's an important part of campaigns. And if I had your voting record, you know, I wouldn't want to talk about it either, and I consider it negative too. If I had that kind of a voting record about taking away a woman's rights, going after the hostile to the gay and lesbian community, I absolutely would try to run away from that, which is exactly what you're doing. But it's important that voters know where the candidates stand on these issues. And if you don't want to talk about your record because you're running away from it, I think it's important for voters to know where the candidates stand, and I will talk about it. Thank you, Senator. Julie Lighting with a question uh, directed first at Senator Ovechenko. Senator Robinson, uh, this question relates to judicial vacancies. There are a significant number of them around the state, which have created substantial backlogs in cases, costing plaintiffs and defendants more money. For business, especially small business, lengthy court proceedings can be a tremendous financial burden. As Attorney General, what, what do you intend to do to relieve the judicial backlog? You know, the fact of the matter is, there's not a lot you can do as Attorney General to relieve the backlog, but I do want to address your question directly because you raise a number of significant issues. First of all, I, the business environment is significantly affected by our tort laws here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. This year, we made a meaningful bipartisan effort to adopt tort reform legislation that would would make significant changes that would make the business environment for Virginia even better. 37 members of the Senate came together, Republicans and Democrats, and worked hard to pass that court reform legislation that was supported by every major business group in Virginia. Three members opposed it. Mark Herring was one of the three members who voted against that court reform legislation. We have got a shortage of judges across Virginia, and quite frankly, we are making progress in filling some of those slots. But the fact of the matter is, we've got we've got a redistricting problem. We have circuits across Virginia where judges are underutilized, where they may have 1,400 cases, and then other circuits like Loudoun County, where your circuit court judges are incredibly overworked and understaffed. Uh, you're down to one judge for a little while. I, I understand, and it, it is. It, it is in some of those circuits where they have 2,800 or 3,000 cases. And we've got to find a way to redistrict and reallocate the burden. Uh, it's not just a matter uh, of adding judges in one circuit. And frankly, when it came time to elect a judge here in Loudoun County in Leesburg, uh, Mark Henry stood in the way of the election of a judge during the course of the General Assembly session. We've got to do better. We've got to do better. Senator well, uh, first of all, uh, you know there are some things that I think the Attorney General can do to help the business community to make sure that uh, the court proceedings move along in a, in a smoother fashion. Right now, the dockets are getting loaded up with a lot of criminal law cases, and what we need to do is make sure that uh, we have an Attorney General who will go to bat and support and be an ally of our local law enforcement and our local prosecutors. And you know, politicians like to talk about keeping our community safe, like to talk about supporting law enforcement, but sometimes you have to vote to make sure that there are budgets that support those local law enforcement, that support our local prosecutors, so that the criminal law docket can move along quickly, and that will help uh, the business case to move along as well. You know, I have been there time and again to support local law enforcement, to support our local prosecutors, to make sure that they have the resources they need to do their jobs, protect our communities, and move the doctor along faster. That's the kind of attorney general that I'll be. Senator Overshane hasn't always been there when it comes to funding and providing resources for our local law enforcement and prosecutors, and that's a big difference between the two of us. Senator Overshane, one minute. 
support reform was important. I was there for the business community. Mark was not. Uh, making sure that we reallocate judges around Virginia is an important step that we need to make in order to make sure that we relieve the burden in circuits like this. I was committed to filling this judgeship. I am committed to making sure that this disparity and workload among judges across the Commonwealth of Virginia is evened out quickly and that we get judges where we need judges. And we need judges in circuits like this. Part of my district includes part of your circuit. Uh, Rappahannock County is shared in your circuit. I have fought to make sure that we have judicial resources necessary to meet our caseload, and we need to do better. I think Tammy, now with a question for Senator Herring. Senator Herring, in 2012, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission voted in favor of the new guidelines on businesses using criminal background checks for job applicants, essentially recommending that businesses eliminate such policies. Should business have the right to run criminal and credit background checks on prospective employees to protect customers, workers, and assets? Two minutes, Senator. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's important that, uh, that businesses be able to operate with as, um, as, they, as they can that we don't overburden them with regulation. And uh, you know, they're gonna need to make higher decisions uh, you know, based on criteria that works for them. And every year uh, there's a process for regulations to be reviewed, or every, every uh, term where the governor can review regulations, and the attorney general is a part of that process. And I will work in that process to try to review those regulations so that business can, can operate smoother. And you know, I will work with the business community as I have as a state senator. Uh, the business community knows that they can trust me, that I'm the kind of leader that will work with them to work through problems. That if something's not working right, they can come to me and I will listen and try to find a solution. That's why business organizations around the state are supporting me or endorsing me, like the Virginia Association of Realtors, the Northern Virginia Technology Council, and the Fairfax Chamber of Commerce. And I've worked with many of you here in the room to advance the interests of the business community. Senator, should businesses be allowed to conduct background checks? They should be allowed to conduct background checks. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, I agree. You know, the EEOC, the EPA, and other agencies have been operating without constraint over the course of the past four years. And Mark Herring talks about taking the politics out of the office. Now, I understand what he means, and I think it is important for us to make sure that we respect the law. But when the federal government steps over the bounds of its authority and adopts regulations or guidances or takes other actions that exceeds the authority uh, conferred to it under the Equal Opportunity uh, Act or under the Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act, we've got to have the guts to stand up and push back and tell them you're wrong. There was a group of attorneys general that went back to the EPA in response to that guidance and said, this is wrong. You're undermining the ability of business to do what it does best. You are getting in the way of the operation of our businesses and you cannot do that. We ought to be able to do those criminal background checks and they sent a letter, they protested to the EEOC, and the EEOC just sent a rather terse response that I saw yesterday for the first time, which basically rebuffed those attorneys general. And I suppose under a Herring administration, we'd turn around and walk away. Under an open chain administration, we would not. I would stand up and push back, just as I would push back against the EPA when it steps into Southwest Virginia in an effort to kill an entire sector of our economy. It's wrong for Virginia, it's wrong for Jacobs, and it's not just a handful of coal miners, it's our railroads, it's our ports, it's manufacturing, it's data centers, it is people living on a fixed income. We have got to stand up and push back where the federal government steps over the line, and I will do that. Senator Gray, one minute. You know, if the Congress and the EPA or any other agency adopts a regulation that exceeds its authority, it's not good for Virginians, I will not hesitate to stand up and challenge that. Now, there are a lot of differences I have with our current, current Attorney General 
you know that, you've heard it this morning. But on one, I think you did the right thing working with Fairfax County challenging the EPA regulation on stormwater. I thought that was the right thing to do. But when I make those decisions, it'll be based on the law, not on politics. And what I won't do is fabricate lawsuits without legal justification just to try to create publicity, just to curry favor with a small spectrum of, the, of a political base. That's what our current Attorney General has been doing. That's what Senator Obechain promises more of, and that's not what's going to be good for Virginia. We're now moving on to the final question of the debate before we move on to closing statements. Dr. Essendarian, you have to say. Senator, over the years, Attorney General have been active in the legislature by having Attorney General sponsored bills introducing varying degrees. Are you planning to propose any legislation for the General Assembly's consideration, and what issues are you considering to address through the legislation? Senator Obertin? Yes, most assuredly I will, and there are a number of areas. Number one, we've already talked about, it's ethics reform. I, I will put forward a package of ethics reform that I will submit to the General Assembly. Number two, as I've rolled out an initiative dealing with the growing threat of human trafficking, and it is happening right here in Loudoun County. If you don't believe it, just look at the post from Monday, or look at Washington, Washingtonian Magazine from June. I, some of the biggest busts in the country have taken place in Fairfax and Loudoun County. And we've got an obligation to stand up and protect families and kids. And these are predators, frankly. These are predators. Gangs have found it more profitable to sell kids for sex than selling drugs. And the average age of these kids is about 13. We've got an obligation to protect these kids in schools, in malls, on Facebook. I took, and I've proposed rolling out, I've rolled out a policy initiative addressing this, which I will be proactive in pushing, which includes creating a standalone offense for human trafficking. I think that we need to do better. We've done a good job over the course of the past four years raising the profile and our awareness of human trafficking and adopting a number of laws. But we need to do better. I carried legislation last year uh, addressing it in a small way. I'm going to carry legislation as Attorney General of Virginia. I've also indicated that I'm going to propose legislation dealing with ethics in the Attorney General's office, capping uh, fees. I'm also going to uh, carry legislation, which I've rolled out an agenda dealing with uh, elder abuse and neglect and exploitation. I, I will I'll be working with our law enforcement with our Commonwealth attorneys, with our public safety officials across Virginia to make sure that we are keeping Virginia safe. I do have plans to, to uh, introduce legislation and with a legislative agenda and it's going to include a major ethics package. You know, we have been, uh, as a state, we have been tarnished by what Governor McDonald and what Attorney General uh, Cuccinelli have done in, with the STAR scientific scan. I've laid out a broad ethics plan, including an independent ethics commission, uh, a gift ban that extends to family members, tougher penalties, uh, and so forth. We've got to do that. You know, I'll also bring forward initiatives of public safety. And, you know, we've got a lot of differences between us. We've highlighted them today. But when it comes to a lot of the ideas about uh, how to protect our criminals, we actually can see eye to eye on a number of things. You know, a couple of years ago, I brought forward uh, legislation to ban spice, synthetic drugs, bath salts, things like that. You know, Mark, you supported me on that, and I'm grateful for it, and kids are better off because of it. Last year, you had a bill that would toughen penalties for uh, uh, life sentences, I think, for uh, child sexual predators. And, and I supported you on that, because it was the right thing to do. So on things like public safety, we do see eye to eye on a number of things. And we can work together to get those guys. Some areas of agreement there between you two centers. Uh, one minute, sir. Yeah, and, and I, I thank you. I've been a leader in keeping Virginia safe, in carrying legislation, protecting kids, standing up to protect us from the worst of the worst, providing life sentences for those who would rape a child. I've stood up for families in domestic abuse situations, carrying legislation that provides for mandatory jail time for repeat violations of protective orders, giving families a little bit of space. 
I've stood up to make sure that our sex and, uh, that our uh, sex offender registry is effective. I've led on this, led on, and I've worked with law enforcement, and that's why 116 sheriffs and Commonwealth attorneys, elected officials from around the state, support me in my bid because they have confidence that I will work with them and lead to make sure that Virginia is a safer place. Before the debate began, a coin toss to see who would speak first. Now we're moving on to closing statements. Five minutes from each candidate. Senator Herring, you're first. Well, again, I would like to thank the Loudoun Chamber uh, for hosting this debate. Uh, thank you, Mark, for coming to Loudoun County. And uh, I think this morning we've seen two candidates for Attorney General with two very different approaches, two very different records, two very different visions for the office. For the last uh, four years, we've seen an Attorney General who has used the office to advance an extreme ideological agenda. And Mark's approach, Senator Roman Shane's approach, has been the same, an extreme social agenda, someone who would, has time and again used the powers and authority he had in order to try to take women's rights to choose away, limit their options for birth control. And, you know, it's an approach that is an ideologically driven approach and worked with his Tea Party allies. I've got a different approach. My record as a senator has been to be responsible, pragmatic, and be a problem solver. That's the kind of state senator I've been. I've been focused on issues that people care about, like transportation, economic development, and job creation, health care, education, building the American dream. That's what, that's the difference between our approaches, that's the difference between our record. And for the last four years, we've had an attorney general like Ken Cuccinelli, who has bent and twisted the law in order to try to impose policies on Virginians that are way outside the mainstream. And Senator Roman Shane will be a continuation of that. We cannot afford to have another attorney general like that. I will refocus the office on protecting Virginians and keeping our families and communities safe, on supporting our military veterans, our service members, and their families, on cracking down against child sexual predators, on protecting seniors from financial fraud and other types of scams, defending people's civil rights, and I will take the politics out of the law, I have politics out of the office and put the law of Virginians first. And if I am so privileged to, to uh, be elected as your attorney general, I will wake up each and every day ready to fight for justice, equality, and opportunity for all Virginians and make sure the powers of the office are on the side of the people. Senator Mitchell. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for, uh, for attending this debate. I appreciate the hospitality of the Loudoun Chamber of Commerce. And Jeff, thank you for your able uh, efforts in, uh, in moderating this debate. Now, I started off this debate by telling you what my focus was going to be in the office of the Attorney General. It is about keeping Virginia safe. And it is about making sure that Virginia is a great place to do business. And quite frankly, we can't have one without the other. We can't have safe communities without a strong economy. And we can't have a strong economy without safe communities. I recognize that. And during the course of my 10 years in the General Assembly, I fought for both. I have traveled Virginia rolling out my policy initiatives for what I'm going to do to lead on both of these areas. And you know what? Over the course of this campaign, I've mentioned a couple of times, but I will mention it again. The people across the state I've worked among the most closely with our Commonwealth attorneys and our sheriffs around Virginia. They've worked with us. They work with me. They've taken our measure. They have evaluated us. They have heard us. They have sat down with us. They have seen what we have been able to accomplish, what we have done, where we have taken the initiative not just on the easy initiatives, but on the tough problems and focused on trying to solve those problems. And 116 of them crossing party lines, Democrat, independent, Republican, they believe that I have the leadership qualities and skills that they want to work with them in making sure that Virginia remains safe and our economy remains strong. We need an attorney general 
who will be a leader, who will stand up and tell you what he is going to do when a lawsuit is filed against the state. And the Richmond Times Dispatch quoted Mark as saying he was going to take a poll of the attorneys in the Attorney General's office to decide in part whether that was an initiative that he wanted to defend. You know what? We can't talk about taking the politics out of the office, but then talk about defaulting on lawsuits that have been filed against the Commonwealth of Virginia and letting, letting groups come in and win by default. We have an obligation to tell you, to look you in the eye and tell you what we're going to do as Attorney General. And I've always done that. And I will always do that. I've told you that when the federal government violates the Clean Air Act in Southwest Virginia, I'll stand up and not just for that handful of coal miners, I'll stand up for Virginia business across the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I will challenge those new regulations issued by the EPA. I will step up and defend the lawsuit brought over the Opportunity Education Initiative. And you know what? If, as was the case several years ago with 3202, somebody files a lawsuit against the transportation bill, I will aggressively and zealously defend that lawsuit. And that's why leaders across Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads have not hesitated to cross party lines and to support my bid for Attorney General because they know that I understand the duties and responsibilities of that office, that I will step up and do that job whether I agree with the underlying policy or not. I leave the General Assembly every February and every March, and I return to my law practice, and I don't have the luxury of telling my clients I don't agree with that law. It's a bad law. Don't worry about it. My job as Attorney General will be to advise a client, a big client, a client with with uh, thousands of employees across the Commonwealth of Virginia with respect to what the law is. I understand the office. I understand the duties. I will work to keep Virginia safe, and I will work to keep our business community and business environment strong. We are facing sequestration, and heaven knows what else is going on. And, the broken city called Washington across the river. We need to stay the, the course now more than ever. We need to make sure that our right to work laws are providing us with the benefits that we're supposed to have. And I'll fight for those, as opposed to fighting for union set-asides. I appreciate your time, I appreciate your attention, and I certainly hope that on November 5th, I can earn your vote and your support. Thank you, and God bless Virginia. So, that wraps it up. The lively and fantastic discussion in the uh, Loudoun County Chamber of Commerce 2013 debate for Attorney General. First of all, a round of applause for our panel here. A round of applause for our panel, Sam Marco. Sam Marco. Thank you very much for Loudoun County Chamber of Commerce. I'm glad you can come back on stage with a few remarks to wrap it up. Thank you. A round of applause for Jeff Goldberg for an outstanding job. <laughs> I also wish to thank our panelists for their service today. Um, thank Senator Mark Olmachain and Senator Mark Herrick for being here this morning for their spirited answers to our debate questions. We wish you both the best of luck in the forthcoming election. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, the uh, Policymaker Series signature sponsor, I know the Loud Hospital. Our advocate sponsors, Access National Bank, HCA, Northern Virginia, Telos, the National Conference Center, and Thought Financial Advisory Corporation. Our enterprise sponsors, Dominion, Genelia Farm Research Campus, and MCD. Our community partner, the Loudoun County Department of Economic Development, and our business partner, the Economic Development Authority of Loudoun County. And of course, thank you to our BISBO sponsors, Cargo Bank, Comstock Partners, Acquire Woods Consulting, Northern Virginia Community College, and the George Washington University. Science and Technology Campus. Join me in a round of applause for I would also thank our elected officials, other honored guests that were here today. I did see uh, Delegate Randy Minshew, so I didn't want to mention that he was here this morning. So. <laughs>
before we conclude, I wanted to provide you with some quick details about the next public policy event, which is also part of our BizVotes education campaign. On Tuesday, October the 15th, uh, here at the National Conference Center, the Chamber will host a candidates forum with the candidates running to represent Loudoun County in the House of Delegates. It is from 8 to 10 a.m. Participation in that forum was contingent upon the candidates completing the Chamber's BizVotes questionnaire. I am very pleased to report that 13 of the 14 candidates running did complete that questionnaire and hopefully will be here. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, all of their answers are posted on the Chamber's website, uh, loudonchamber.org slash bizvotes. I encourage you to look at those. Um, I also encourage you to come to the forum and see what they have to say as you consider your support for candidate in November. Tickets and sponsorship information are available on their website. Finally, election results are determined by the people who vote for it. So please, don't forget to vote. And don't forget to remind your friends and employees to vote on November 5th. It is so important. This concludes our event. Thank you for joining us today to make a part of the Lawton County Chamber of Commerce. Have a very successful day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.